There's a stream of lead from the guns, and he's got him. That's one down. Increased engine power allowed the airframe to carry heavier weaponry. In World War I, most planes had one or two machine guns. By World War II, fighters like the American P-51 had six. Its Browning M2 machine guns fired the large and very lethal 50 caliber bullet. It held about 980 rounds of ammunition per side, so it, it was a very, very effective combat weapon in air-to-air -air combat. About every uh, fourth or fifth shell was actually a tracer so that the combat pilot could see the effective path of his bullets going towards the target. Armed to the teeth, fighters from all sides became decisive battle winners. Their machine guns could destroy other planes, carve up convoys, annihilate tanks. Well, some uh, theorists thought that the air of dogfighting would be impossible because airplanes were moving in excess of 300 miles per hour. Targeting became a combination of guesswork and basic deflection. This involved firing the guns into the space ahead of the target to allow for the speed of the enemy plane and the speed of the bullets. If a fighter plane did find itself in a tight corner, very often it would perform a split S. The pilot would invert the plane, execute a half loop, and end up flying level in the opposite direction. The P-51 with altitude would come down into a six o'clock position. Usually the 109 would try to pull up and you'd go into a split S, and hopefully you would end up on its tail and uh, be able to shoot it down. The Mustang could go as tight as you could pull it. Whatever you wanted it to do and you were capable of doing, it would do. Uh, we could keep up with the 109, uh, we could outperform it, outturn it, we could outdive it, we could outfly the 109. Three P 51 groups, the 8th, 9th, and 15th, shot down an incredible 4,950 German planes. But dogfights weren't limited to Europe. In the Pacific, American and Japanese fighters also engaged in fierce air-to-air -air maneuvers. American pilots would team up in pairs, flying the ingenious Thatch Weave. Named after Lieutenant Commander Jimmy Thatch, two planes would fly a parallel course until a Zero latched onto the tail of one of them. They would then bank steeply inward. If the enemy pilot followed his target, it would lead him into a deadly position where the other member of the team could shoot him down. The major air forces began to produce a series of classic purebred fighters. Two of the best were the British Spitfire and the German ME-109. The Spitfire had large elliptical wings with low wing loading. In aerodynamics, wing loading is the loaded weight of the aircraft divided by the area of the wing. This gives engineers a rough idea of the aircraft's lift to mass ratio, which affects its rate of climb, load carrying ability, and turn performance. If you compare it to the ME-109, which was its German opposite, you can see that the German aircraft has got a much smaller wing, and that means it's got a much higher wing loading. There's a lot more aircraft per bit of wing on the ME-109. And that means that if you try to turn an ME-109 as tightly as you can turn your Spitfire, the wings will come off. Because the wing on the Spitfire is so gorgeously, lavishly big, and because of that nice elliptical shape, the Spitfire can turn a lot tighter in a dogfight with an ME-109. Any claims, Johnny? Uh, a 109 destroyed, but yes. Oh, good show. When Spitfires and ME-109s went head-to-head -head and the Spitfire outturned the ME-109, the German pilot only had one chance, deploy his landing flaps. Bei der Messerschmitt waren die Landeklappen so angetrieben, 
You could change the angle of the landing flaps electrically from 10 degrees to 20, 30 degrees and so on. The Spitfire could only do two positions, flaps down and up. The German pilot, the Wily Rabbit, could use it in tight turns. When the Spitfire was behind him and he couldn't keep up with its tight turns, he just changed the flaps to a 10 degree angle. Thereby he had more lift and the plane could turn better and could maneuver outside the target area of the enemy. And then he puts the flaps back in and dived nose down to escape. Great wing design helped both the ME-109 and Spitfire become legends. But they weren't the only World War II fighters breaking new ground in aerodynamics. The P-51 Mustang became the first production airframe built with laminar flow wings. Laminar flow is the smooth, uninterrupted flow of air over the contour of the wing compared to a turbulent flow. A wing with high laminar flow should experience less drag and turbulence. Engineers applied this principle to the Mustang's wings. Its cross-section, or airfoil, was relatively thin at the leading edge and progressively wider to a point of greatest thickness at the aft. The result? Drag was reduced, lift and speed were increased. This was a new invention um, back in the late 30s and early 40s. This was the first airplane to ever incorporate a laminar flow wing. In 10 or 15 years, they went from biplanes that did 120 miles an hour to airplanes like this, which were top speed of 505 miles an hour. So the advances that were being made were being made weekly during that period of time. And the laminar flow wing was just something that was developed at that time and first put on an airplane uh, in the Mustang. The evolution of laminar wings was a huge step forward but it didn't provide all the answers. As an aircraft climbs, the air gets thinner. Of course, there's less oxygen, and on an engine, the power will drop off. With the Allison engine, it had a power ceiling of about 15,000 feet. The higher you go, the thinner the air gets, reducing the amount of oxygen intake to the engine. When mixed internally with the fuel, it's less combustible, resulting in less power. A solution was needed and designers soon found it. Engines like the famous Rolls-Royce Merlin used a supercharger, an air compressor that forced more air into the combustion chamber. More air meant more oxygen. More oxygen meant more power. More power meant more height. Once you put the Packard-built Rolls-Royce Merlin engine into the P-51, you discover that it's capable of operating up to 40,000 feet. Once you put the Merlin engine into the P-51, you find you can go at almost 440 miles an hour. The key modification that turns the Mustang into the brilliant fighter aircraft that it was, the key invention was sticking the right engine into that aircraft. Equipped with the Merlin and extra fuel tanks, the P-51 could fly a phenomenal seven and a half hours. This meant it had the range to escort American bombers all the way to Germany and back again. They get rid of their long-range wing tanks before the fight, and down they go for the kill. Story goes, once Goering uh, looked up one day and saw the Mustangs in the contrails overhead and uh, said the war is lost. The P-51 was one of the last fighter aircraft propelled by piston engines. The Merlin had made it one of the fastest fighters on the block. But when the first generation of jet engines hit the skies, the P-51 was history. The origins of jet technology go back to the 1930s, when scientists around the world tried to find a faster engine. One of them was a British RAF pilot, Frank Whittle. He was studying the gas turbine to uh, see whether it could be applied to aeronautics as a means to drive the airplane propeller, but was finding that this was really almost too difficult. Um, and then he perceived the turbojet and discovered that indeed jet propulsion appeared to be the way to go. Jet engines work by sucking in air at the front with a fan. A compressor compresses the air before it's passed through a combustion chamber. There, the air is sprayed with fuel and ignited. The burning gases expand and blast out through the nozzle at the back, creating thrust. 
Today, most planes use jet engines, but in the 1930s, Whittle's pioneering work was ignored by the British Air Ministry. Even so, he didn't give up. In 1930, he patented the idea himself and continued his research. His way of fighting the war was to produce a turbojet airplane. So all these wretched things that went on to stultify the development of the turbojet in this country were very, very frustrating for him because he really wanted to produce a war machine. The clock ticked. Whittle's patent for the engine lapsed. Around the same time, a German physicist, Hans von Ohain, started working on a similar device, an engine capable of propelling an aircraft without a propeller. For a long time after the war, Whittle insisted that Ohain had seen Whittle's expired patent and had copied Whittle's invention and that he, Whittle, was the inventor of the jet engine. After the Second World War, the two of them get together, they discuss their inventing processes, and both Ohain and Frank Whittle appear to have been convinced that each of them developed the jet engine independently. Whittle hoped his jet engine would help the Allies win the war, but it was the Germans who won the race to produce the first operational jet fighter. In the summer of 1944, they unleashed the ME-262. Now that one would come out of nowhere at you, you know, and even the speed with which it went made it almost impossible for you to bring your guns to bear on it. The 262 had a top speed of 540 miles per hour, making it the fastest fighter in the world. But for all its extra speed, the 262 was not going to be a war winner. It came too late. Too few were built, and its maneuverability at lower speeds was questionable. In fact, American P-51s found they could sometimes catch and destroy the enemy jets. We were escorting the bombers, and just as the uh, B-17s started dropping their bombs, uh, we were hit by a swarm of uh, ME-262s, the German jet. And uh, I was up uh, high at, a, at about uh, uh, 26,000 feet. Now, I looked down and I saw this uh, ME-262 coming in behind, behind one bomber and blowing it up. At that time I rolled over and put full throttle and started down at him. By the time I got within firing range he had blown up his second B-17 and uh, I started firing and I started getting hits in his left engine. The ME-262 was piloted by German ace Walter Schuch. Walter had 207 victories to his credit, but in P-51 pilot Joey Peterbers, he finally found his match. When I was shot down in my ME-262, I pushed the plane downwards, so my plane only got hit once. I dived into a cloud, and as an experienced pilot, you know that you should not come out in the same spot. They wait for you above it. I turned 45 degrees in the cloud. They kept looking for me, but I was gone. For 60 years, Joey had no idea what had happened to his adversary. But then, out of the blue in 2005, he received a phone call and an invitation to meet Walter. Over a couple of beers, the German admitted that he eventually had to bail out of his ME-262. We didn't have an ejector seat and I had to see how I could get out. I pulled myself up with both hands and pushed my foot off the joystick. And then I sailed down. It went really fast. And on the 18th of May 2005, Walter and I met for the uh, second time, the first time in person, and we're the best of friends. Joey's P-51 might have won the day, but the ME-262 marked the beginning of the end for propeller planes. Jet fighters were the future. <laughs>